I think I did it properly. Yeah, it's recording. All right, maybe we'll give it about another minute or two for people to show up. I'm Jordy Hicks. Um, I'll be presenting today on teaching and learning in the outdoors. Uh, I keep moving this along. Uh, welcome. There'll be plenty of time today for q and I'll start off just sort of with an introduction to myself and what we're doing. We'll watch a short video that I created, uh, part one in a series. Um, hopefully uh, some of you are educators, some of you might be just, you know, interested in this process. Um, I've, you know, I'm, I'm not new to this uh, idea of teaching in the outdoors, but I'm sort of new to the idea of teaching others on how to teach in the outdoors. Um, it's always been something that just sort of came naturally to me. And uh, in the last couple of years, I've been uh, really interested and motivated to help others get outside. And the pandemic really sort of put a focus on the need to be outdoors and away from the indoors. And uh, it was a catalyst for sort of this process for me. Um, uh, it's 3.44, maybe at 3.45, I'll get started. Um, I'm an APS teacher, so I am very good at Google Meet but I am not exceptionally good at Zoom. Uh, so uh, you'll have to maybe potentially bear with me. Uh, I'm used to seeing a bunch of letters on my screen and students typing in the chat. So, uh, you know, just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. And I imagine all of you would be more comfortable, uh, you know, doing the, uh, let me do this, uh, talking uh, to some extent, but I will be able to see the chat as we progress through this. So if people have questions, you're more than welcome to ask and we'll address them as we progress. We're actually gonna to begin today uh, and with a little bit of an activity. Um, it's fairly windy, but the activity, and I'll get to this in a sec, does sort of request that you take a little time outside, um, but the wind should be an, an important point in this activity. So uh, it's 345, I'm gonna begin. So this is uh, Teaching and Learning in the Outdoors. My name is Jordy Hicks. I'm a science teacher at Atrisco Heritage Academy. I'm a TLF, which is a teacher leader facilitator for the district. I teach biology. I teach dual, dual credit geography and AP environmental science. And uh, here we go. So the first thing I would like you to do today is to do something that I, an activity that I do with my students. It's a really good sort of introductory activity for going outdoors and having either you or your students um, sort of orienting yourself with maybe a space that is different or unfamiliar, unfamiliar or um, just sort of something for fun. So I would like, if you're willing, uh, I always tell my students, I have students at home right now and uh, they're learning from home. I have students in the classroom and I tell students at home that if you're unwilling or unable to actually go into a yard or go outside, then at the very least you can open a window. So uh, one thing I'd like you to do for a few minutes, let's say in about 10 minutes we can return, which gives you plenty of time to go outside and really sort of take the time. I think one thing that we often forget to do in the hustle and bustle of our lives is take time to sort of focus on something beyond ourselves and something that we might not normally focus on. And what I'd like you to do is do what's called a sound map. Um, and what this involves is you can do this on paper, you can do this in your head, you can just make some general observations and come back to the group and sort of share if you're willing. But what a sound map is, is you go outside and you close your eyes and you sort of visualize where the sounds you're hearing are coming from. Um, orient yourself to the north if you are inclined to do so. I'm a geographer by training, so I always orient to the north. And then uh, what I have students do and what you can do if you'd like is close your eyes and on a piece of paper or in your mind, Imagine the directionality of what you're hearing, what you're experiencing. Is there a bird to the south? Is there a car making a lot of noise to the northeast? So uh, take a few minutes, it's 347. So around 3, 4, uh, 355, 357, we can come back and I'd like you to make a good effort to go either to a window or go outside and try to do a sound map. You can leave the screen and venture away for a moment uh, I'm going to go do this really quick, so I'm going to walk away, so you won't see me for a few minutes. Um, I'm going to go outside. I'm at school right now, but I'll see you in about uh, 10 or so minutes, so have fun.
So if you're just joining us, uh, we're off doing a sound map right now, uh, listening to the outdoors with eyes closed as a warm up activity that I often do with my students. So uh, we'll be back into the, into the meet in about two or three minutes. But if you're able to try to enjoy uh, the sounds and focus on your surroundings and close your eyes and see what you can experience. And then we'll share out when we get back. Jordy, I did see a question in the chat about um, if everyone was uh, able to hear sound. So I wonder if you have any modifications for um, hearing impaired folks. Um, I, on YouTube, you do have you have the option for um, captions. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of this um, activity, you could, I mean, this activity could be used in a variety of ways. You could have it be visual, it could be tactile, um, it could be, um, you know, scent as well. So I often, when I do uh, a nature journaling activity for my students, I often have them go through each of their senses. And um, so it can, you can easily modify it to be something that you can, like different tactile sensations that you experience, things like that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I guess we had a miscommunication, but I love that you brought it to all the senses. So <laughs> yeah, I, I have a sort of standardized nature journaling project. And um, one of the things I do is I have like this today or do the sound map and then do, you know, touch five things or 20 things or whatever and describe, um, you know, the sensations or, you know, smells and things like that as well. That's really cool. All right, about two more minutes, I'd say, or ish. We'll see when people get back. I mostly heard wind, but I heard some birds. And if anyone wants to maybe share, if you're coming back already and you don't necessarily want to talk, but you would like to uh, share what you heard or anything interesting you noticed, you can go ahead and type that in the chat. Um, or we could take a little bit of time and see if anyone wants to share their experience. I'll, I'll probably go first, but like I said, we'll give it about another minute for people to, you know, maybe someone's got the Merlin app open and is eagerly trying to identify that bird they, they see in the distance. That's what I'm typically, if I'm outside and I don't already know the bird, I've got my Merlin app open. So, and if no one knows what the Merlin app is, it is a magical experience to use.
All right. So um, looks like we'll probably start returning now. Looks like many people are back inside. So does anyone want to share in the chat or share out loud anything that they notice? I'll go first, and then as you can think about what you maybe heard. Um, so I went out, I'm at school, I went out in between two buildings here, and mostly what I heard was wind. So I decided to play around with that and orient myself in different ways and focus my line of sight so that the wind was passing, you know, by my head, so it wasn't in, hitting my ears, so I could hear a little better. And um, you can play around with the wind too, and you can, if you, you know, depending on the directionality of the wind, you can hear things in one direction, but maybe not the other direction. So uh, I heard some birds, I heard what I believe were sparrows. Uh, flying around. There were more than one. I heard someone running, so I opened my eyes and saw the cross countries out uh, running uh, around the buildings right now. Uh, I heard a couple cars. And for me, like, I just find this experience sort of an easy way to, and a short way to sort of focus your thoughts in a different way, take a break. If you're transitioning students, it's nice to sort of go outside and just reorient yourself to a different experience, and then you can start something fresh. Um, I often tell people who are maybe apprehensive or unsure about, you know, going outside with students or utilizing the outdoors that a good way to use the outside is just as a transitional place, um, something to give a break to students, but then also get them to think, get them to be curious and inquisitive and get them to write. Um, does anyone want to share anything of interest that they noticed or was, were, were most people like me just hearing wind? And if you want to type in the chat, you can, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, earlier I was out transplanting some flowers into one of my flower beds and I'd put up a uh, hummingbird feeder. And while I was bent over, I heard a uh, broad tailed hummingbird fly into the feeder and was there for a second. As soon as I looked up, it was gone again. Wow. Right over my head. That's the, that, I mean, I'm, I was, I've been telling people at school, like now's about the time they start showing up. Uh, I haven't seen any yet. I haven't set up my humming, my bird feeder yet, but now this is about the time. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's a very distinct sound. Anyone else like to share dogs barking an assortment of birds. Excellent. Um, the favorite, my favorite bird in my neighborhood when I'm out back, just listening is the curve build thrasher. It's got a great set of sounds. Uh, it's a fun bird to have around. Um, Traffic, I heard traffic. Anyone else have anything anything profound or amazing other than wind? Uh, I heard, I didn't realize until I sat down and did this, but I kind of heard like ringing in my own ears, <laughs> like an internal sound. So that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that is interesting. And that's something that's, you know, that's a, you, you, you had an experience with that. Um, the sound of wind in pine trees. I like, when I, when it's windy, I try to, tell students like it's, I just hear the wind well move around a little bit you know go behind a wall go to a different tree do you notice any tonal changes do you notice any you know turn your head a little my kid she's six and um she likes to go out in the wind and turn her sideways and then turn forward and hear it in one way and hear it in a different way and um so like, even the wind and what might seem to some as something monotonous and boring can actually be pretty interesting so thank you welcome um so let's continue next we're going to watch a short video. I'm going to mute myself so you can, and I, I believe we, I might be presenting audio. I don't actually know. I'll have to, let me stop presenting for a sec um, and make sure I'm going to present audio. I, like I said, I'm not super well versed in, here, share sound. There we go. And then share. Um, in, where to go? Where do we, no, I lost it. Here we go. All right. Um, not super well versed in Zoom. So uh, this is a video series I made uh, for a presentation about a month ago. Um, and I've been sharing it with people on my campus. I'm sort of like the go to outdoor dude on my campus. My email signature says unofficial animal wrangler for my school. Um, because I've over the 10 years I've been here. Uh, if someone finds a tarantula, they call me if someone finds a dead bird, they call me if someone sees something crazy. They call me because I've established myself as that person. I set up scopes on campus to watch owls nesting, um, always sending out op, uh, you know, videos on the tarantulas that are coming out in August and September to find their mates and tell people that there's nothing wrong with it. So um, you know, I'm the official sort of unofficial outdoor person for my campus. And uh, I created this video series for that purpose and also to share with others and to use 
uh, to share with others in the district. So we're going to watch my first video. There are five videos in the series and possibly more in the future. Um, so I'm going to mute myself. As you watch, uh, the video quality should be adequate, but you'll at least be able to hear what I have to say. I'd encourage you to write down questions potentially in the chat or on paper, and then we'll discuss it a little bit uh, when I'm done. So I'm going to mute myself and then present. All right, so welcome to my video series on outdoor education. My name is Jordy Hicks. I'm a science teacher at Atrisco Heritage Academy High School. And I've been utilizing the outdoors for my teaching for 10 years, which is about as long as I've been teaching. Now, the outdoors has always been a really important part of my life, and it's where I find a lot of comfort, and I want to bring that into my classroom. Not just so that I enjoy teaching a little bit more, but also so my students can gain some insight, gain some experience, breathe some fresh air, get some vitamin D, and sort of experience the ever-changing dynamic cacophony of sight sounds and textures that can come with just spending some time outside. Um, this will be a multi-part series, mainly because some of you might not need everything here, and you might benefit from clicking around and navigating the playlist to see uh, what is of most use to you. So the first video is this one, sort of my introduction as to why I do outdoor education, the philosophy and methodology associated with why I do this. The second video, which if you want to skip ahead, you can find here, will take you to the sort of hows and logistics of outdoor education, all the lessons I've learned through planning or in many cases just making mistakes. Um, the third video will be about how I maybe use the outdoors as just an extension of my room, just a place to sit that isn't indoors. You can find that video here. The fourth video will be a variation of that, but instead of utilizing uh, the outdoors as just an extension of my room, use it as an extension of my curriculum. Use outdoor spaces to actually enhance or accentuate the things that we are learning in class. That video can be found here. And then the next video in the series will be how to sort of contemplate using the outdoors beyond your class, beyond your school, so that students can actually spend time outdoors or even just looking outdoors uh, on their own and in their free time and utilizing the community resources that are available to you to enhance or accentuate your education, your curriculum, your teaching. And that video can be found here. Chances are there'll be more videos that you can click on and find eventually throughout this series. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started with the sort of whys of outdoor education. Thank you. Outdoor education, what's the benefit? Well, you can consult, you know, countless educational psychology, evolutionary psychology, pedagogy, journal articles and find ample evidence to support the idea of outdoor education but for me it's about being comfortable in what i'm doing it's about enjoying a, a space but it's more than that as well it's also you know it's kind of a trick that i use to prevent my students from compartmentalizing their learning uh, i'm a geographer by training and there's a concept in geography called tobler's law of geography tobler's first law of geography and it says that you know, basically that all things are related to one another, but near things are more related than far things. Now this applies uh, primarily at a spatial level with you know, physical objects or concepts within uh, human geography, but I think it can apply as well to education. Um, the way I view that is that if our students are cooped up in our classrooms learning our content and only from sort of one perspective and they're literally placed in a box and learning in that box, then when they leave that box, they might disassociate their learning uh, from the real world. They might associate your content exclusively with your classroom. And if you remove them from that space and you bring them into a different space where they may pass by on a regular basis on their way to lunch, then they decouple your classroom with your content and apply your uh, expertise and your curriculum with other spaces beyond your uh, for walls of your classroom, and I think that has value. So even if it's in the hallways beyond your building or around your campus, when they're out in that space, you're essentially uh, tricking them to remember your content. If you utilize your community as part of your curriculum, then when they are navigating that community, they are refreshing their memory, they're reinforcing, they're building that scaffolding of content, of knowledge with the outside world and I find that is pretty useful. So if I can teach them something that relates to, in my case, biology, 
and I take them outside and show them a plant that they walk by every day, then maybe every time they walk by that plant when they're not thinking about my class, they end up thinking about my class. And there's nothing wrong with that. So for those of you a little bit apprehensive about beginning this process, I have two pieces of advice. One, start simple. Start with your content, obviously. And an easy way to begin is just with journaling, nature journaling. Nature journaling doesn't have to be something specifically done in the life sciences. It can be done in any content. It can be done on any topic. If you teach language, if you teach English, if you teach math, if you teach social studies, there is a place for a nature journal in that content. And that's a great way to get students outside, sitting down and thinking about their surroundings and applying it to your content, to something you're learning in your class. Um, even if it's just a matter of when they have writing to do, when it's informal writing or note taking, you know, move them from the indoors to the outdoors. And there's benefit to that, vitamin D, fresh air. Also, something I call walking with intent, just go for a walk, ask them questions, contemplate questions ahead of time, and just go for a walk with your students. They love getting out of the classroom, and just use that time and use those spaces to get students to not only sort of think away from a phone or away from a screen, but to also utilize their observations of the outside world to generate thought, to generate questions, to generate inquiry, and potentially generate discussion as well. Now, one of the big issues recently with outdoor education, obviously, has been the fact that we are remote in the district and students are at home, I'm at home, and taking them outside is basically impossible. However, there are ways to do it. Once again, nature journaling is a great way. It's an informal form of writing that allows them to sort of get away from the screen, get away from the indoors, get away from artificial lighting, and spend some time outside contemplating your class, contemplating your content. Um, I often tell my students to just go sit and listen to a podcast under a tree if the podcast is relevant to my content. Uh, providing incentive, not necessarily requirement, because we have to consider equity. This is a big part of what we're dealing with now, and we don't want to increase the level of inequity in our system, in our cultural system, by forcing students, requiring students to do something that they're maybe physically or literally incapable of doing. So I hope you enjoyed this part of the video, but it's not over yet. There's more to this series. So you should be able to click somewhere on this screen to be taken to the next video. Enjoy. All right. So um, maybe we can share, uh, Kateri, if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing this presentation. I think I changed the settings so that anyone with the link can view. Um, we'll need to share the Jamboard thing as well. There are some resources in this presentation. Um, yeah. All right, so welcome to... All right. Um, and I, it'd be nice that if you had questions, if you wanted to uh, utilize some of the resources, watch the video, go to the YouTube playlist. Um, we'll get to some of that later. Plus, there'll be a Jamboard that we'll share in the chat as well that you can uh, sort of communicate with others when we get into breakout rooms. Does anyone have any questions that relate to the video um, before we progress? There will be time for questions later, but if anyone has anything now that they'd like to discuss or ask, um, this would be a good time. All right. So that being said, um, so did, I mean, if anyone, does anyone here, just since I allocated time in my schedule to do this, um, about two more minutes. Um, so yeah, um, thank you, Nisa, I believe. Um, but does anyone utilize the outdoors currently on their uh, campus or in their life for their work? Uh, I know not everybody here is a teacher, um, potentially, but uh, I'm wondering if anybody, you know, found any issues with what I said, potentially? Any conflicts or problems or any questions? Um, if not, we can progress to the, to the breakout room and you can have a chance to talk with others and uh, discuss some other questions Then we can come back and discuss that. But if anyone has anything to add, now is a good time. I, I have a question, but it's kind of my, always my question, which is I teach forest school and I've taught, taught school gardening, but just any tips you have on managing groups um, that's always somewhere in your presentation. I'm always interested how different teachers manage groups. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's, I mean, I think I benefit from the fact that I am a six foot two white male and I, you know, have a lot of privilege in our society and I accept that and acknowledge that. And, uh, and it's easier for me to get people's attention because of my height and because mm -hmm. of, you know, you know, my voice to some extent. Um, also it's a matter of training. Like I don't just go outside 
and immediately give them a bunch of work to do. I don't immediately have these high expectations. I we sort of build and through baby steps to these experiences. So mm -hmm. typically when we go outside, it's, you know, we're just outside, we're just asking questions. And mm -hmm. it's easier said than done for like a bio teacher like me, somebody who teaches biology, but you know, um, they have to sort of buy into it. So I often, I've found the hard way by, you know, learning through my mistakes that with students, especially they, just like with anything, they need to buy into you to some extent mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. they, you know, learn from you and listen to you and accept you as an authority figure. And that takes time. But I find with my students that actually that one of the easiest ways for me to get them to buy into me as their teacher is to take them outside because it is so different for many of them. Like they don't often have teachers that take them outside just to go outside or just to look at a plant or they, like this idea that every part of the day has to be regimented and scheduled, like scheduled 10 minutes of just hanging out outside and ask one question. And I find that when they sort of see that, they buy into me, they buy into what I'm selling, and then it makes it easier going outside. And um, I teach high school, so I teach freshmen through seniors. Freshmen, I need to be pretty on top of them. I say, stay where I can see you. I'm moving around. I'm keeping an eye on them. They push the boundaries a little more. Seniors in my AP class, I give them a pass and say, go do whatever you want to do. Um, I'll put, send them off on their own to go collect bugs from pitfall traps or to go look at the Raven's Nest or whatever that's on campus. And they're pretty reliable, but they, they have sort of bought into that concept that this is what we do and there are expectations. And also like everybody on my campus knows what my past looks like. They know that I'm going outside all the time. Um, so it takes, you know, it takes some of that step-by-step step, baby steps first. And then um, at least from my perspective, but I do, like I said, like being a six, two dude that has a pretty, a voice that carries pretty well, makes it pretty easy. Um, easier than, than many. All right. Um, if anyone else has anything, we can uh, save those for later. So we're going to move on to uh, breakout rooms where you have a chance to communicate with uh, smaller groups and there will be a jam board. So we'll put the jam board into the chat. There you go. You can open that up. Um, the way it'll work is we'll be in these breakout rooms and uh, there are three different uh, slides in the Jamboard. And when you're in your breakout room, what I'd like you to do is sort of have one person in your group um, be sort of the, the designee for writing down a, uh, on a little post-it note, you can select on the side how to write on a little post-it note and just any sort of general thoughts that you had that relate to these questions. There are two slides uh, in the Jamboard with questions. What hurdles or apprehensions do you have about outdoor learning? And then maybe where are you in the process? Um, and what resources are you looking for? So there are two slides with questions. If you want, work on one of them or work on both of them. Um, and then the third slide, I added a bunch of pictures of stuff from my campus uh, that I do outside. And if you have any questions about some of the things you see there or some of the things that I've done, um, some of the lessons I've learned, when we come back, we can sort of work towards that. So you're gonna have 15 minutes. Um, you know, designate someone, or if you're in a small group, you can maybe each reply, just make sure you're aware of the space provided. Um, and then we'll come back in about 15. So it's 4.13 now. So we'll come back in about uh, 4.30, um, which works out. Um, so I don't know how to do that. I'm hoping, Kateri, do you do the breakout rooms or do I do that? Just open the room so folks could join now. About three three people. Okay, there we go. Room. Excellent. I guess you and I are not, since we're the, we're the host, we're not going to the breakout rooms, correct? Yes, okay. correct. So um, I, I guess you can pause the recording at this point because, and then we could start it again. Right. It's a little bit heavy. There's a lot there. It's a lot to go through. Um, I'm using right now for my, uh, some of my journaling. I'm a big fan of Aldo Leopold. Uh, Sand County Almanac is one of my go-to books that I check out every year. I use Thinking Like a Mountain in so many of my classes. Um, and he, there's a, the Leopold Education Project has a, a nature journaling curriculum that would be useful in social studies or uh, English or science classes. And I'm, a, I'm using that quite a bit now. There's actually a, I have it here somewhere. There's a, a little, a bunch of little like cards 
So this is these little note cards that have little nature journal prompts on them. And it's kind of fun. So I've been using these when I can't think of my own or don't have the energy to think of my own. Um, so these images here that you're looking at, if you're all here uh, on the Jamboard, are some of the things I've done uh, with my students. Obviously, I teach life science. I teach environmental science. So I fully acknowledge that it is so easy for me to take students outside. It, it makes more sense to be outside than to be inside with my classes. Yet there are biology students here at my school that have never taken their kids outside. And I'm kind of crazy about that. Um, so some of the things we've done on my campus, we had a project a few years ago with the senior class where we built a rain garden. So we transitioned to space on campus that's up here. I'm looking at it upper right. Um, we were able to get a grant through the Albuquerque APS Education Foundation, uh, where we got tools to not only do the, green, the rain garden, but also start on the greenhouse down in the bottom center. Um, and it was a great project and students are obviously the ones working on it. They're proud of it. They come back and look at it. Um, sometimes you just go for a walk and you find a praying mantis. This is Greg down here holding a praying mantis. Um, it took some convincing to get them to hold it, but once one person held it, almost every single student held the praying mantis, which is something almost none of them have ever done, and it's awesome. Uh, we have owls nesting on our campus right now. For the past three years, we've had great horned owls nesting on our campus, so I got a picture of them. Uh, I also have a scope set up to watch them. We used to have ravens, but as if you know anything about ravens and owls, they are mortal enemies and owls often steal the nest of ravens. So uh, there were ravens there, now there are owls there and the ravens are nesting somewhere else, but just yesterday they were not happy with each other. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, down here in the corner is on campus. Uh, I'm super lucky that we have a massive amount of open space on our campus uh, where we can just wander around and check out cool stuff and set up insect pitfall traps. Um, we did find a rattlesnake on campus once. That was exciting. I moved it. Uh, luckily, I'm semi-prepared for that in that experience, um, but my wife was not super happy that I decided to move a rattlesnake. Um, and it was a young one, uh, but I knew kid, it was all over the internet. Kids, the kids found it and then came back to me and said, we found a rattlesnake. And I, I just knew that there's probably no one else on campus that knew what they were doing with it. So I took the, took the plunge and uh, it was a blast. It was awesome. And then I have students, one thing I do uh, with my students every year for my AP and sometimes my biology is I have them create an interpretive dance of the water cycle or the carbon cycle. So this is when they're outside doing their, uh, this looks like uh, maybe runoff. It uh, looks like runoff from the water cycle. Um, so anyway, let's take a look at what some people said. So let's go to the first one. What are some of the hurdles or apprehensions? Because I think that's an important one to get through. This is one of the difficult ones. Uh, does anyone want to share or would you prefer, does someone want to share one of these if you want to volunteer? Maybe the uh, safety and fear of the outdoors, someone who was worried about that. Does anyone want to share their apprehensions or share a solution potentially before I ramble on? This is my practicing wait time. I'm usually pretty good at it. But if no one wants to share, that's no problemo. You guys might not be here to share. You guys might be here to just listen to me ramble on. I'm capable. I'm more than capable of talking for a very long time. I can uh, talk about that one. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, we were talking about, um, first of all, management of I, that many students at a time and uh, not kind of being able to have an eye on everybody. And so that was the safety one. And then the fear of the outdoors I think uh, if I'm remembering correctly was related to um, students feeling kind of uneasy about being outside and not being used to being outside whenever they're in that type, whenever they're at school in a learning environment. Yeah, um, that's definitely, I, I'm very always cognizant of safety, even though it doesn't look like, like if you look at the picture behind the, the post-it notes things, uh, obviously, I'm not that concerned about safety because those students are walking on a ledge that's like 11 feet off the ground. Uh, that was by choice. They, they chose to do that. Uh, I gave them a choice to walk safely downstairs. Um, so, you know, but yeah, large groups is challenging. Uh, what I find is useful for me is having very specific designated areas where I have an idea and a plan for that specific area. Um, but when I'm outside, I'm always watching. And obviously, if I'm in my classroom, I don't have to like keep my eye on everybody to make sure they're 
like in the room, it's pretty easy to notice when someone is wandering out of your classroom. But when you're outside, uh, it's, it's pretty important. I've had as many as 35 students outside. I typically don't have classes larger than that, but I've had 35 freshmen outside with me. And sometimes things go poorly, but typically they don't. I often, you know, set those expectations. I build them up to it. We, like I said earlier, there's the baby steps. I always keep a rec, like keep a list of who's with me. So I keep attendance when I'm out there. I'm always counting. Like I'm always counting when I'm outside. If I know it's 28, I'm looking for 28. Uh, that's challenging. Um, but I also find that initially I was really afraid of that. My first year teaching, I was really sort of worried about that. But then I found once I got kids outside, they were sort of grateful to be in that environment. And it ended up not being a big deal. Um, I've, I'm always concerned about bees. I always warn students about, you know, walk and watch where your feet are, watch what you're touching. Don't get too close to plants if you're worried about insects. Although we were holding, you know, we hold tarantulas. Um, but yeah, safety is one of those big sort of hurdles that a lot of people deal with. Does anybody who's in the meet have a, a solution that to this that you've dealt with or um, that I haven't covered? Because I think that's that's one of the biggest hurdles is overcoming that safety aspect, the concern aspect, the apprehensions around that. Does anyone have a, a strategy that I didn't share? I think one thing you know we do in the garden when you're learning in the garden is always cultivating that respect and responsibility that we have you know like every just embracing it as a learning opportunity you know and um before you introduce the tool you know you introduce how to use it and how to use it responsibly and respectfully so i guess just look moving into it um in a way that embraces that as a learning opportunity is always a really good good thing. Yeah. And also um, part, an aspect of that sort of baby steps is being outdoors doesn't mean it has to be a space that's really unfamiliar to students. Like our students here on campus eat lunch outside all the time. Um, there's plants around them all the time when they're out in the courtyard or when they're walking from one building to the next. So even just, you know, initially taking them into spaces that they're already comfortable with, that they're already familiar with, but having them look at their surroundings in a slightly different way. I teach life science, but if you teach math, you can take, like there's math everywhere. You go outside and math is in every aspect of the outdoors, whether it's the angles of buildings in terms of architecture, whether it's the number of rocks in a certain area, or you know, there's so much you can do outside in comfortable spaces that students interact with and move through on a daily basis multiple times. And I found that like taking them to the spaces that they're comfortable with is a good place to start. You know, These are places that they're in every day. And like I said in the video, I'm tricking them, right? So I'm taking them to somewhere where they sit for lunch and I'm teaching them about the plant that's right behind them or the little spittle bug insect parasite that's on the plant that they've never noticed before or the fact that this plant is flowering now versus this plant is flowering later. What is flowering? What is pollination? How do plants reproduce? And all of a sudden they're eating lunch next to this plant and they're like, dang, darn it, Mr. Hicks. I'm now remembering your class and learning on my free time. Um, and that's just sort of the benefits of using those common spaces. Um, does anyone, so that's, those are some of my ad, advice. Um, administration, I noticed someone wrote administration. Um, one thing you can do that I've learned to, in order to be uh, on the good side of administration is be very, very communicative about what you're doing, what your plans are, where you are, make sure you can be found at any times, uh, a time of the day. I keep, the front desk has my phone number on a sticky note year round. I call the front desk every time we go outside and say, this is Hicks. We're gonna be out in front of D building. I have a map. I literally have a map on my front door to my classroom. And I have a post-it that I move around and say, this is where we are today. So if anyone needs to find us, they can call me, they can find us. Um, and administration is, at least at my school, has always been really open to this. And as long as there's communication and they can find me, um, and as long as they know what I'm doing and I have justification for that, and I'm not letting students run wild, um, I've never had issues. So, and, and, and that, involved, that involved making sure that like I'm talking with my principal, I'm talking with my buildings and grounds principal saying like, this is where I'm going, this is what I'm doing. Do you have any, is there anything I should do? Is there anything I should know? And before doing it, really making them part of the decision-making process and conversation. Um, lack of shade, here, one thing I wanted to address, and if anyone wants to share in, can someone talk to about, we had two people or two groups 
talking about the, um, the curriculum and how going outside might deviate too much from the curriculum. Does anyone wanna chime in on that and some of those apprehensions? Cause that's an, like safety, that's another big one. Do a little bit more wait time, Just a little bit more. All right. So curriculum, since no one wants to talk, that's fine. Uh, it's, like, it's like I'm back in my classes. Uh, at least I can see some of your faces. Um, so curriculum is, is a challenge. Uh, I would say from my perspective, uh, as someone who has limited knowledge of Common Core, but has extensive knowledge of NGSS, I think it has never been easier to take your students outside. Um, I think the curriculum offers way more freedom than the old state standards used to. Um, the old methodology of what you had to teach was pretty focused. It was pretty limited. It gave you very specific things that you needed to focus on. And my interpretation, at least for social <laughs> studies and English common core, not as much for math, but I think there's room there, but definitely for science, all science classes, uh, common core and NGSS, the non national science standards for the state, New Mexico STEM ready is what they call it here. Um, they give teachers an immense amount of freedom to sort of play, you know, jazz with their curriculum, I, I find. I, that's my interpretation. Um, it's fairly open-ended. It does sort of uh, ask teachers to have students be inquisitive and encourages inquiry. And in my opinion, a great way to have students ask questions about biology is to take them into the natural world. If you want students to ask questions about chemistry, show them some rocks, show them some soil, show them a plant photosynthesizing, show them the atmosphere and talk about climate change. Um, if you want your students to learn about physics, go look at a baseball field and you've got ample physics uh, represented there if, you, if your students know anything about sports. Um, and I think for any subject, uh, even if it's just, if you're writing, if you're doing an informal writing assignment, think about going outside versus staying in the classroom if it's a nice day. Um, but like I said, for math, like math, there is so much math out there, it is outrageous. Um, and I think you know, having that perspective when you're looking at your curriculum, when you're looking at your standards, um, looking for moments, like I don't, I'm not, I'm, I happen to be outside every day in my class um, this week and in the future, I'll be outside pretty much every day because it's easy for me and I'm used to it. But it's a matter of sort of looking through your curriculum, through your standards and saying, well, here's an opportunity here. Like this standard here, I can do this in an outdoor space. It doesn't mean that the outdoors is a component of the lesson. It doesn't mean you have to look at the tree to study Fibonacci. It doesn't mean you have to hold the pine cone to look at the golden ratio. It doesn't mean you have to measure the height of a building or uh, write about, you know, a, write about the view that you see about like Le Camino Real or something like that, depending on where you are. Um, but as I say in other videos, sometimes you can use the outdoors just as a learning space, and then you can sort of move your way towards using the outdoors as an actual like component and, you know, uh, tool within your curriculum. And I'm now at the point where I'm using the community as my curriculum, where I'm actually taking students off campus. I'm uh, asking them to visit places. I'm asking them to examine their neighborhood. Um, so... I think if you, if you look at your standards through that lens and you think about the outdoors, it, I think you'll find stuff there. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert at, at Common Core, but I definitely know that from my perspective, the science standards and the English and social studies Common Core do give you some freedom to look at, to be outside. Um, and honestly, I find that students are often better as being at being students sometimes when they're outside. Uh, so you might actually be able to get through more content. And um, does anyone else have anything to add before we sort of, we have quite a bit of time. So I, I have plenty I could go over. Um, let me look at the second slide really quick. And then if people want to share something from that first slide, we can still do that. So the second slide was, where are you in the process? So that, that image behind the post-its there is my outdoor, mini little informal outdoor classroom right outside my window. I can see it right now. Um, over the summer, when I wasn't sure if we were gonna go back to school in August or at any point, I called Baca's Trees and said, hey, can I have some stumps? And they said, yes. So I went with a pickup truck and picked up a bunch of stumps and set them up outside my classroom and my neighbor's classroom. She teaches biology as well. And we have about 30 stumps out there that are fine for sitting. Um, 
and it's uh, it's fine. It's a good space. And it, my students have told me that they know what's going on with this pandemic. They they hear the news. They know that uh, outdoors is you're more likely to be safe outdoors than indoors, and they appreciate the opportunity to not be in a classroom somewhat close to their peers. Um, need more shade. That is a lesson I did learn, not only as someone who gets sunburned on my bald head, but someone who doesn't want students whining all the time. Um, so I often, I'll, I'll walk around my campus and I have like a mental map and like a literal map of at certain times of day, this location has half shade, half sun, because I have students, they want to be in the sun. And then in the exact same class, the, some students want to be in the shade. So I often need to be able to provide you know, a little bit of comfort. Discomfort is not terrible. It's not a big deal to be dis not comfortable for a short period of time. Uh, that's, you know, teach, it builds character, right? Um, but that is, a, that is something to consider. And that's why I set up these things in spaces that have maybe a tree during the summer or fall uh, with leaves. Um, and then for making sure that you have a space that it's comfortable. Um, enough seating for an entire class, especially when you have a full class when we're back in the fall, hopefully we have a full class of students. Uh, yeah, th those are challenges. And my recommendation to people here on our campus and in general is the first step to this process. If you're the type of person that is sort of curious about moving outdoors, whether it's simple stuff or using it as your curriculum, um, the first thing I would do is as a department, maybe during a meeting or just on your own during a prep, go for a walk and examine your surroundings, not as someone who's rushing from your room to the coffee room because you're busy all the time, but try to find time in your schedule to just go for a walk. Uh, look around your spaces. Look at what is available to you uh, in terms of built infrastructure for seating, for housing students, um, content that might be out there that you haven't noticed yet. Just today, just today, this happened today. I was outside with students doing some nature journaling and we found some owl pellets in a planter. There's, there's big planters on our campus and there's owls, as we know, and we were just looking in this planter and all of a sudden I look down and there's a little owl pellet and we look around and there's some bones. And this is something that I just noticed for the first time today, just because I was there and I was, I had the time to look. And um, now we, now I'm going to go all over campus and look at these other planters to see if there's an owl occasionally sitting in a tree barfing up owl pellets. Um, and that's something just today that just by taking the time and sort of being present in my surroundings and not worrying about getting from point A to point B because that point where I was, was where I wanted to be. Um, I noticed something new and it was awesome. Um, and I encourage, that's, that's the big thing I encourage people to do is find the time. If you're on a, if you're on a campus, if you're at a school and you're not, you haven't done this yet, find the time to just walk around, like convince your department to go on a walk as part of the curriculum development for next year. Um, so question was, do I ever send out questions for the community? Um, what is the soil? Why to recycle? Uh, to some extent, yeah, I'm, I'm very connected with some aspects of my, of the community uh, around here, um, more so in my sort of wheelhouse. So I uh, am familiar with people who work for the Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program, BEMP, out of Bosque School and out of UNM. So I work with them quite a bit. Uh, I work with the geography department and the architecture department to some extent at UNM. I work with Vida Oro quite a bit, um, although not as much this year as I would have liked. But I, I'm often, um, if there's something I'm interested in, I send an email or make a phone call and I contact someone in the community and I ask them, can you help me? And if not, who do you know that maybe could? Um, snowball sampling, I think is what it's called. And um, I was shocked a few years ago that 90% of the people I contacted were like, we are more than willing to help you. How can we help? How can we be part of what you're doing? Um, in terms of soil, not so much. I do soil stuff in my AP environmental, but mostly uh, not a ton. Um, but that would be, you know, involving maybe soil scientists, uh, USGS. I know people in USGS that do stuff like that. Um, New Mexico Environment Department. There's a lot of people out there. Recycling, yes. I work with, I have uh, contacted, because uh, recycling is another easy thing to get kids outside. That's what I've found. We have I had to like invent a recycling program here on my campus and we didn't have enough resources. So I just called waste management and said, do you have any old bins you're getting rid of? They said, here's 10. Um, so now we have a bin for every floor of every building on our campus. And we occasionally classes will go outside and take recycling just uh, to dump it where it belongs. Um, so yeah, the community is an excellent resource. And that's sort of that third step. So if the first step of 
outdoor learning is you just take your class and move it outside. Nothing else changes, you're just in a different space. That's step one. Step two is the outside is the class. The outside is a component of the curriculum. You're looking at trees, you're looking at the horizon, you're measuring buildings, you're looking at rocks, you're writing about you know, your experiences, you're incorporating the outdoors as a component of your class. And in my opinion, that third level of you know, accomplishment um, is the community. It's taking your students into the community and involving the community and in bringing the community on the campus as well. Like you said, uh, in terms of soil, uh, there's a lot you could do with soil, especially if you're gardening, especially if you're starting a garden or interested in starting a garden. Terry's the person to talk to in that regard. Um, so uh, any other questions? Ready-made lessons, interesting. Can, can, so I guess, do you, you so whoever said ready-made lessons, do you mean you would want lessons already pre-made? Um, I think some of the resources that have been shared, the John Muir Laws stuff, um, there is stuff out there. I can uh, speak to that one. Okay. Um, we were talking about excuses that um, the, someone in our group had heard from other teachers that don't take their kids out in the garden. So, um, yeah, I think, so the teachers don't take them out because that, and the, the, excuse, the excuses they don't have something to do, is that the idea? Just that it's not as easy to teach like the core lessons that they're expected to teach, um, right. which no one in our group really agreed in terms of like, we all thought that there's plenty out there, but that's a common excuse that people will give for why they don't right. do it. Yeah, um, I think if, if like, if you have a department or if you have a school that and, the, and there is a priority to bring people outside. Um, I find that if I share resources, maybe a couple of people utilize them. I'm definitely seeing more people outside now than I've ever seen on my campus. And I think COVID has a lot to do with it. And maybe that's the, 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 the catalyst that people need to realize that, oh, it's not that bad. Uh, like right now, almost all of us on our campus have half as many students as we normally would. And that's easy, it's a lot easier, but you can get some of that experience, you can train. And um, however, that being said, you're, you're never going to get 100% buy-in, at least in my point. Mean, the hope is you will, but you may never get 100% buy-in. But my hope is that maybe students, maybe every student spends time outside at some point, maybe hopefully multiple points uh, within their year of learning. Um, you know, some, some teachers have mobility issues. Some teachers are allergic and are apprehensive. Um, some students, some classes, it's just not really feasible. Um, and I totally understand that. And I'm, I'm not... I don't really want to try to like coax the one person uh, who might not do it. I'm interested in supporting the 10 that are interested. You know what I mean? Um, but that means that, and then, but then as you, as the community of outdoor learners and outdoor teachers sort of grows, more people are sharing resources within a department. Like I'm sharing within my biology department. I said, like, I'm, I'm the only one that's outside every day in my biology department. And I'm outside every day in biology when the weather's nice. Um, but I'm always sharing here. Here's a nature journal idea. Here's John Muir Law's uh, curriculum. Here's a link to some of the other stuff I'm doing. Here's blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, they might go out once. But hopefully you hope that that experience is rewarding, is meaningful. They realize that the students like it. The students may be asked to go out. On my campus, the students definitely hear about me going around and doing stuff and they ask questions. Uh, why can't we go outside? Can we go do that too? Um, and it's about sort of like slowly building that culture and um, work, like I said, working with admin to help provide sort of that community um, and the incentive to, and the, 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 you know, allowing people and, you know, accepting the fact that people do this. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's not really a great answer because like I said, you're never going to get everybody. Uh, that's the hope. Um, not everybody wants to garden. As much as I love gardening, not everybody wants to, wants to appreciate that they their food comes from the grocery store and they're okay with that um although just give them a tomato that grew off the vine and maybe they'll change their mind that's that's definitely changed my mind when i was young and ate a tomato from a garden versus a grocery store it changes your life um how often do your classes meet what percentage of time do you go outside so uh high school schedule i meet with each class three times a week typically um and i'm outside about 
50% of the year on average, um, basically, but, my, but I've designed a curriculum and my subject to, to do that. So I spend almost all of September, October outside in my classes. I spend almost all of April, May, and a little bit of March outside in my classes because uh, I've designed my schedule to do that. So in, for biology, in the first, for the first semester, we do almost exclusively ecology. And I'm outside, we're looking at everything, we're doing pitfall trapping, which is, if you don't know what that is and you teach science, it's the easiest thing you could do to get kids interested in ecology. Um, you just put a cup in the ground and cover it with something, maybe put some bait in it, and all of a sudden you've got scorpions in a cup. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, if you don't want scorpions, you're definitely gonna probably get some beetles. But um, I'm, I'd say about 50% of the year, I'm outside once a week or more. Um, not as much as I'd like, but now that I've set up some outdoor learning spaces, maybe we'll be outside more often. It's more difficult obviously now because I have half of my students at home in their bedrooms, hopefully listening, but in many cases not. And um, that's obviously more difficult. I can't force them to go outside and do the nature journal. So I have to incentivize it and provide some grace and some resilience on their part um, in order to get them to do that, which is difficult. Not every, like, and that's why I say, like I have to be willing to say, you know what, open a window. Just open a window and there's something that you can learn from that experience. There's something you can gain. Um, so that's, but, and I think, uh, you know, having those spaces and finding those spaces, that was key for me. Um, one thing on this image that I maybe didn't go over was these two middle pictures. So a couple years ago, um, I've been talking, I've wanted an outdoor classroom on our campus forever. Um, so I sort of like just built my own or we just sit wherever, but I was able to convince the senior class a few years ago to say, hey, you have $15,000. How about instead of painting a mural that no one, that is pretty, pretty, but we have like two murals on our campus already. How about instead of painting a mural that is no one uses, you use that money to build an outdoor learning space. And guess what? They were able to do both. They were able to pay for an outdoor learning space and they were even able to paint on the walls. Um, so this costs like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, which they were able to raise. It doesn't seat quite as many as we would have hoped, but we're working on that. But it's a space that's covered from this. You have shade, you have seating. We did a bunch of planting. I got an additional grant from the Nature Conservancy uh, to, build, to put some xeric and native plants in the area for butterflies and pollinators. Um, and this was the class of 2019 senior gift and people use it all the time. Uh, last year, the senior gift, I convinced that group to put in a pond uh, that's going to be used as like nothing like what they have at Sandia. If you've ever seen what they have at Sandia, you're going to be, your mind will be blown. It's astounding. Um, but this was, this was nothing like that, but it's something that we can use as a, as a peaceful location to learn, look at microinvertebrates and, you know, study the water quality and just have a nice place to be. So um, sometimes you can like just have these places, like help facilitate the development of these places. Um, I'm pretty established here on campus. I've taught every graduating class that we've ever had. So it's easy. If you're low on the totem pole, it might be hard for you to say like, hey, we should have an outdoor classroom. But no one listens to you. So um, I've been there, but uh, you know, you'd be surprised. Uh, get a network, find a community on your campus that is willing to work in this way. And maybe have, I have people who teach English and math who work with me and we share ideas and resources. And we talk about the same curriculum certain times a year. So you'd be surprised. There's, there are people on your campus, if you're a teacher, that are interested in this as well. And, uh, you know, send out a, a massive email and see what you can get, see what kind of community you can form. Because uh, you'll benefit if, like, for me, I love being outdoors. That's where I'm most comfortable. And I always tell my students that the human brain is adapted for outside. It's not adapted for straight lines and four walls indoors with recirculating fake air. Um, this is, that space, if, 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 you know, psychologists and psychiatrists are prescribing nature walks as a, as a treatment for depression, then obviously that, that there's benefit to being outdoors. And I see it all every day, my students are out there. Um, not with every student, but in most cases, they're benefiting from that, from that experience and they're enjoying it, which is awesome. Like that alone makes my life easier as a teacher. Happy students means happy me. Uh, any other questions, comments, queries, quandaries, conundrums? We have about, I think, 10 minutes, they, or nine minutes, they shut us out of here. And if anyone has anything in the chat, um, the last slide, let me go back. So if you go back to the, let me present this now. 
whoops. Um, so we did the share outs. So if you have the, um, the, the, the presentation, which was shared out earlier in the chat, um, there are some resources here. Um, the first one is the link to my YouTube playlist for the five videos I created. The second one is like my notes. So if you don't wanna watch five videos and spend an hour watching videos, then just look over my bulleted notes. Um, it, there are some hyperlinks in here as well that take you to some resources. Um, this is that I believe the John Muir laws that, let me go back to my presentation mode anyway. Um, I believe that uh, nature journaling activity is the John Muir laws curriculum. There's, it's a free curriculum. You can download it for free. Um, there's a, a worksheet for just a, a walking worksheet on campus. I believe Terry shared that. Um, there are some ideas for the current virtual environment. And then NMPED has a lot of really good resources as well. And so does the state of New Mexico. Um, if any of you are interested, there is an organization in the state called the uh, New Mexico Education, uh, Environmental Education, Environmental Education of New Mexico. I forget, they changed their name recently. I'm a member of it, yeah, E-E-N-M. Um, I think I've seen maybe some of you at the meeting last time when we were down in, uh, um, in Duranes and we all took a picture. I'm on their picture on the website. Maybe some of you were there. Um, but yeah, Environmental Education of New Mexico, they have a lot of phenomenal resources and it's an excellent network of people. Um, it's a fantastic way to get in touch with people who are in the Forest Service, who are in uh, at Vida Oro, who are with the Biopark. Um, it's a, it's, if you're interested in outdoor education and environmental education, um, I would highly recommend you network and get involved with the Environmental Educators of New Mexico. I always enjoy going to those meetings um, whether or not, where, wherever they are, hopefully they'll be around soon in person. Um, and it's a great way to meet people with the Sandia Mountain Natural History Center, with Vida Oro, with the Biopark, uh, waste water, with water treatment, um, with uh, Rio Grande Nature Center, uh, state parks, national parks, um, excellent, excellent resources with uh, environmental educators of New Mexico. I highly recommend if you're interested to look for them. Um, thank you for sharing. Uh, any questions while we have a few more minutes? And if you need, I'm gonna put uh, my email. If you need or have questions for me or wanna contact me and you're not with APS, it's pretty easy to search for me if you're part of APS, but if you're not, that's my email. Um, you're more than welcome to contact me. I can't guarantee I have all the answers. I say sometimes I am not an expert, but I have experience. And um, this is just something that feels natural to me and I have done a lot of it. So if you have um, any questions or have any, want any guidance, I'm more than willing to help out. Um, just reach out and I'll, I'll be around. Um, but otherwise, if anyone has anything, you can type in the chat or you can ask, but it's uh, you know, still windy, but it's a nice day. I'm looking forward to the weekend. Um, I have a quick, quick question. Just sure. if you guys could give me some um, feedback. I've been thinking for a while about developing like a, I work at County Extension and we have horticulturists and such, but I've been thinking about developing kind of a, a plant identification piece for if you want to do a campus, you know, plant walk. And yeah. I'm just wondering if that would be helpful. Like say it would have like the 30 most common plants in this area and a picture and would that be a resource that would help? I mean, are plant walks? Yeah, we, I, I'm pretty much that resource for my students, but we actually a couple of years ago created one uh, for our okay. campus where we just had like, it, it's in a Google Drive and I share it with the, with teachers occasionally and I share it with students. Um, it's a little hard to navigate. So usually if students have questions, they ask me. I have um, some of those little hand, those little foldable field guides. Like there's a okay. blank one, um, mm -hmm. those are nice, but they don't have everything. But I, I think, you know, that is, if someone's interested in that as a resource, um, for their campus. I think it's cool. I love knowing all the plants, when they're going to flower, when to find them, uh, what they are, what smells, what is a host plant, things like that. Okay. Um, so I think it's, I love it. And my kids, you know, they don't love learning scientific names, but they occasionally find it fun. Mm -hmm. um, but they do like knowing the names of plants. I think that there's something nice about sort of the knowing the names of stuff. They but do I think love the cool story research. about the chase tree. They do love that story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it'd be a cool resource. And uh, okay. I think a few other people Maybe. would as well. And I will say that Merlin app, 
If you, if you mm-hmm. want to be impress your students on campus, get out the Merlin app, identify the bird and start playing the calls at full volume and you'll get birds talking back to you. And the first time students hear you do that, they, are, they think you're some sort of like demigod or something. Um, it's pretty cool. And I do it all the time. All right. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I don't, can't see your name. You raised your hand, though. You have a hat on. Uh, darn it. Uh, oh, I had a question about edible plants on campus. And I thought it would be fun to take a little tour. Is, are there hazards on APS campuses with uh, spraying for pesticides or herbicides? I, I didn't know if that's part of the district's way or not. I think, Kateri, can you answer that? I have an opinion and based on observation, but you might have a better answer. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would let you, I'll de- defer to you, Jordy, on that one. <laughs> so based on my observations, anywhere on my campus, I think it's up to the school. I think it often depends on the school. Um, I think they sometimes determine where they spray. I have observed on my campus that in uh, landscaped areas where they have pre like water, plants that are being watered that are on an irrigation system, they will occasionally spray for uh, a weed killer. Um, we have areas on our campus that no one cares about. That ha- that's where all the medicinal plants are. Is that wild place up in the corner that no one cares about? No one sprays anything up there, as far as I know. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, uh, so that's from where we actually have like wild rhubarb or sand dock grown up there, which some people have looked at. I've always wanted to have someone in the language department start a curandera garden on campus. And I'm like, I just have, there are so, only so many minutes in the day and I teach three subjects. So it's very hard for me to do that. But um, that would be something to maybe get the conversation started. It's like build a community to start something like that. Um, there's a community in town, I was talking to Kateri about it called the Yerba Mansa Project or the Albuquerque Herbalism. Uh, Dara Seville is a contact I have there who's awesome. She is so cool. And she would be a good resource uh, to help with stuff like that or their website. But um, I think- Before they kick us out, um, for a long time, APS was using something called Crovar, which is a, a perpetual, it's a three to five year pesticide. Um, so we need to fi- find out, Katir, if they're still using it, um, because you'd find these areas where nothing would grow for years. And then we figured out they're using Crovar and mm. um, it's nasty. So it'd be yeah. cool to figure that out. But that's a good excuse to start a, uh, uh, ethnobotany club or uh, something where you can grow some of your own stuff. Um, I've always wanted to do that and never found the time. I do know there is a no spray list for um, the schools that's kind of under the radar, radar, but uh, principals can opt to be on that no spray list. I'm not sure if it applies to Crovar, but I will definitely follow up on that and get back to everyone. The question was asked about great horned owls. I have been about three feet from a baby and about five feet from an adult when they were in the tree down by our field. I don't have any particular curriculum, but I'm sure you could find uh, lots of cool stuff in mythology and uh, New Mexico history and uh, lots of interesting stuff uh, related to owls throughout a lot of English and mythology. Um, so there might be some pretty cool curriculum or just some readings you could do. There's, we all look at owl pellets. There's all sorts of labs for biology with owl pellets. Um, I always think that's one of the weirdest things to buy over the internet because it's kind of, it's fun. It's fun, but we have them on campus for free. Um, but yeah, cool. Uh, so yeah, I would say, look for that. If you, I can try to find something. If you email me, I might be able to find something, but it's awesome having the owls on campus. I love having them on campus. Um, even just to look at. Well, thank you so much, Jordy. This has been awesome. Um, we did record it, so everyone can view this later um, and share, share away. And um, we will join back in a large group now um, in the main session and be able to share kind of what we've learned as well as give away some prizes. So see you back in the main room. <laughs> thank you.